Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight on our news. Shantytown residents react to those recently posted government notices. BPL Union responds following last night's island-wide blackout. Our news is brought to you by Alive. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Dragovich. Topping news tonight, one day after members of the Shantytown Action Task Force began handing out notices, residents in one of those illegal communities are reacting, insisting the government is trying to do too much too soon as they believe they will have nowhere to go if their homes are destroyed. Despite their concerns, members of the Shantytown Action Task Force were back in those communities posting notices. Jasmine Brown has all the details in this report. Members of the task force visited this illegal community just off Golden Isles Road, where the shanty town was far from typical. <coughs> An ice cream truck making its rounds, multi-level homes, several utility poles, a convenience store and gated properties make up this shanty town located just off Golden Isles Road. Residents here say they have invested a lot of time and money to build their homes. We met two of those homeowners who admitted they do not own the land, but pay a monthly fee to the landowner to live on the property. Jessner Philosis says it's simply unfathomable that their homes could be reduced to little more than rubble. I think everybody who are human will feel uh, something different, will feel sad. If they come to destroy all the, all the houses, we will have a big problem as in the Asian community. The government began handing out the first of three notices to residents in shanty towns across New Providence on Monday. On Tuesday, those teams were back on the ground, this time posting notices on lamp holes. Oh, sorry, sorry. The notices advise residents to present valid building permits or occupancy certificates to the Ministry of Public Works. Secretary to the Shanty Town Action Task Force Morgan Graham says more letters will be handed out over the next three weeks. Well, today what we're doing is we're posting the same notice in Creole and English where it can be conspicuous for all the residents to see. Despite the message being clear, the shanty town residents say they are still in shock and bemoan the fact that many of them would become homeless. They even asserted that the government will have to assist them. I think they're still shocked. Why do you think they're shocked? Okay, like you see now, so right now, how you could get like the apartment, like to to put all those people. Where you go get that? So you can't afford to move? I don't think so. I don't think we could afford to move massively, massively. I think, yes, if that do gradually, that could be able to do in the right way. But like 14 days, like July, right? That will be too quick. I've been in the house, right? But I know how the law goes, right? But I'm only taking my chances, right? If you come through to live in life, I'll be there. I have no problem with that. So if they um, demolish your home, if they come through, they say you don't have a right to be here and they demolish your home, what would you do next? What can you do? I got to focus with them. They got to find a way for me to live. You can't get a chest push me out like that. You got to do something for me. But not everyone sees it that way. Transport and local government minister Frankie Campbell says the time has come to get rid of illegal communities that create parallel societies. I've always been against the idea of two parallel societies. Campbell, whose mother is Haitian, has in the past acted as a liaison between the Haitian community and the Free National Movement. While some shantytown residents expressed shock at the move, Campbell, who still has strong ties to the Haitian community, says it's long overdue and it's more than just an illegal immigration issue. I support what is being done. I'm satisfied that it is being done in a humane and compassionate way. I'm satisfied that due and timely notice have been given. And I believe that many of the persons who live there are very cooperative and will assist the government. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. 
In other news, the Department of Immigration may be forced to close its doors during the first week of July as it prepares for the June 28th rollout of its modernized system. Immigration Minister Brent Simonet says their new computer system should have cleared customs this week. He revealed that the budget for the modernized system has increased by more than $7 million. We're introducing a new um, immigration system similar to the passport office. It was done by Canadian Banknote at the initial cost of 11.3 million. The cost now is at 18.6 million. We hope to roll that out on the 28th, which is this week, which may entail closing immigration for a couple of days, first week of, first week of next month. Um, and then it'll be, we hope to be totally paperless. So this issue of finding the file will not come about and the system will be integrated with uh, the Treasury system, so the money side will also hook up with the immigration side. The modernized system comes amid plans to reform existing immigration laws. Simonet says the public can expect sweeping changes. It's not just a simple amendment, it's a total rewriting of the entire immigration rules and regulations and laws, so it'll take some time. In the meantime, Simonet says putting a dent in the huge backlog of citizenship applications remains an uphill battle. The immigration minister says they typically swear in up to 28 people every two weeks. However, officials have only been able to locate 10 people for a swearing-in ceremony scheduled for Wednesday. We have about five filing cabinets of persons who have either had permanent residence or citizenship approved. There's, um, we, try, we started to contact a number of them. I have a, uh, my, uh, an employee specifically to assigned to calling them. We're finding a large number of them have left the country. They're no longer here. Their cell numbers have changed or they're just simply not, we cannot contact them. So when, you, when we talk about the backlog at immigration, we're working on it. Well, July 1st will mark the beginning of the 12% VAT era. Jared Higgs tells us a bit more about where the increases may hit the hardest. With a 60% increase in value-added tax set to become law on July 1st, it is wholly anticipated that businesses throughout the country will simply pass the tax hike on to consumers. This means higher prices across the board, with the exception of certain items such as medicine and bread basket items, which will be exempt as of August 1st. But what about school uniform? It's not exempt from VAT, and many would argue that it's not cheap. RNU has visited popular uniform retailer Sandy's to find out just how much the average parent pays for school uniforms. According to staff, dozens of customers have come in early hoping to avoid Sunday's VAT increase. A shop assistant who guided us through the uniform section says girls typically require three jumpers, two blouses, two skirts, two PE shirts, one pair of PE shorts, and at least five pairs of socks. The total cost of these items, when factoring in VAT at 7.5%, comes to $275.20. With the July 1st increase in VAT, that cost will increase to $286.68. The difference may seem small, but the overall cost doesn't include the cost of a pair of shoes, a backpack, or a swimsuit, which is required by some schools. And what about boys? According to the shop assistant, most parents will purchase five shirts, four pairs of pants, two PE shirts, one pair of PE shorts, at least five pairs of socks, one tie for older boys but two for younger, and one belt. The total cost for these items at 7.5% VAT was already a staggering $361.30. At 12%, that figure jumps to $376.30. Again, like the girls' list, this doesn't include other necessary school supplies like tennis shoes for PE or undershirts. Some may suggest that it's cheaper to shop abroad, but not everybody can afford to travel. Others may suggest cutting back on school supplies. However, in a country where we value education, that may be a hollow suggestion. One passerby we spoke with says she sympathizes with those who still have to do school shopping. Well, I haven't bought any school uniforms in a long time because my son is away in school now. But, I, you know, I don't really know what the value is on that right now. But I'm sure it could be very expensive for a lot of the parents out there who have to buy uniforms for like two or three kids. It could be going up to 12 percent. Over in the grocery store, parents stocking up on school snacks will need to budget the additional four and a half cents for every dollar they spend. This variety pack of chips will cost $11.19 on July 1st, up from $10.74. This 10-pack of Mott's apple juice will go from $6.22 to $6.48. 
Spin wheels will jump to $3.80, while raisin cream pies will go from $3.54 to $3.68. On the healthier side of things, bananas and Granny Smith apples, which cost $1.06 per pound with VAT, will cost $1.11 in just five days. If the numbers seem small, it's because they are on their own. However, when analyzed with overall spending, many would consider contributing 12 cents on every dollar of spending to government as a significant amount. Now, the owners of Sandy's, who do not wish to appear on camera, had lots of complaints about government's rollout of 12% VAT. They say government giving exemptions of up to $500 to travelers didn't take into account the fact that many people would then choose to do their shopping abroad, leaving them as the retailers without vital customers during these summer months. They also say that government's August 31st deadline for them to change the prices on their shelves is simply not enough time. A store with thousands of individual items, the owners of Sandy's questioned who would help them to cover the labor costs associated with changing the individual prices of the items in their four stores. Over at SuperValue, a store with even more items and more locations, they'll have to spend the next two months adjusting prices on their shelves to reflect one 12% VAT inclusive price. Some businesses have also complained that introducing the VAT exemptions a month after increasing the rate of VAT is confusing and have suggested that government should have rolled out all its initiatives on August 1st. The Ministry of Finance released guidelines yesterday that give retailers, particularly large ones like food stores, until August 31st to be compliant with VAT pricing on the shelves. Technically, they all should be VAT compliant on July 1st, but they have a two-month extension on pricing items on the shelves. At the register, however, they'll be adding 12% VAT as of Sunday. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. Just two months following Bahamas Power and Light's promise of fewer power outages, and the island was in darkness yet again. Last night, a lightning strike caused an island-wide disruption in power supply. But as BPL union leader Paul Maynard tells us, the root of the problem goes much deeper. Our Jillian Gray reports. Complete darkness covered the island of New Providence last night as inclement weather caused another island-wide blackout. And while a lightning strike may have triggered the shutdown, BPL Workers Union President Paul Maynard said the problem really lies with the equipment. Because of our system, we have ancient equipment. I've been saying this now for four years. We have ancient equipment. The breakers, the, we need a new protection system. We need a protection order done, we need a new protection system. Last night, lightning hit. The breakers do not respond quickly because the equipment is ancient. Power outages have been a constant problem facing residents in New Providence. In April, an island-wide blackout left residents in darkness for hours. Maynard said fixing the problem will cost a pretty penny. I understand that they are bringing in someone to do a protection audit. You know, that's a million and a half just there. And to fix the problem, that's, that's at least 20 million. According to BPL, power was restored to most areas of New Providence by 10 p.m. However, there is no way of predicting when or if the lights will go out again. Now, while the outage lasted anywhere from an hour to three hours, depending on your location, one resident said he was shocked by how quickly power supply was restored. I mean, I was expecting it to be off like for a while. Half hour after that, it was on. That's prior to when I learned about it. And I was pleased with the timing. I don't know about no one else. The time that I discovered it came on, it was good. Now again, Maynard said they do not expect the power outages to be frequent throughout the summer months. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. Still to come on our news, a company selected to manage and operate the New Providence landfill. Plus, what Doctors Hospital is doing to address an EMT shortage. That's coming up when our news returns.